Welcome to the Tenkara Angler Level Line Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Agnetta, and today I'm joined by Anthony Naples and Matt Smet. How you doing, guys? Good. Good to be here. Good to see you both. Yep, yep. Good to be here. Looking forward to it. Cool. So today's podcast is going to be, you know, relatively a loose, loose agenda like we typically do. But I thought I'd kick it off, you know, for those that don't know, we're recording the day after Christmas. Um, so to kind of keep that holiday theme without picking it quite into the new year yet, um, I was curious how Christmas went for each of you guys and if you got any fishing gifts this year. Not specifically. Uh, I did get some resources for my traveling, uh, oh, but uh, no specific gear, really. Uh, but I, I kind of like to buy my own gear anyway. So, uh, you know, some cash is always a good thing. But no, no, no nothing on my end. I am. Um, yeah, nothing specific either. I think, yeah, like everyone knows, like it's such a niche arcane thing, you know, that so... I, I didn't get get any gear. I gifted myself some stuff. So I got. Um, I'm trying to. Um, I'm trying to outfit, you know, my cottage up in State College with like a double. Like I want to have like doubles of everything, you know. So that's what I'm working on. So I got a um, the Nirvana vice from uh, Dragon Tail. So I haven't had a chance to mess around with that yet, but I I needed another vice, so I figured I'd give that one a shot. I don't know if either of you guys have played around with that but it's nice i haven't ever had that kind of vice you know with those you know i've always had the uh uh the different kind of jaws you know like the cam action so it's a right. different thing for me so so that'd be cool um and then i got a ragnarok rod from them um for up there and um and then um i want to say thanks to the folks from the uh the last podcast there were a lot of good suggestions for wet waiting gear some stuff that uh like the the Choda cloaks someone mentioned I don't remember who um which I'd never heard of so um that's gonna be my my uh next gear acquisition for myself in the new year some kind of either those or the uh maybe look at the hippies again or some you know other suggestions that people had so that's my next kind of big thing is that whole wet waiting thing and, and there were I don't know four or five things suggested in there so thanks yeah. folks for um, playing along with that that, that'll be the gift that Santa forgot, right? You'll, you'll yeah. pick it for yourself after the case. For those that aren't familiar with what Anthony's talking about, the Chota cloaks are actually kind of cool. So they're what they are is you can, if you happen to wet wade in your, you know, sneakers or sandals or hiking boots or whatever they are, they're actually kind of these neoprene socks that zip up over your, you know, your current footwear and they have a felt bottom. So they give you additional traction on the stream and they're relatively you know inexpensive i forget what they are maybe they're 50 60 bucks something like that they're not they're not Damn. super expensive so you know if you're going from spot to spot and especially if fishing isn't necessarily going to be your primary primary thing like that sounds like a like an awesome thing it was something i did a little bit of research on after i saw that comment and they were mm -hmm. really really cool yeah they look cool and they look like it looks like you could throw them in a in a backpack or something yeah if you're biking and, and along tra trail along stream or something yeah it looks like a cool option that I'd, I'd never heard of so i hope you get them you can be the guinea pig for our group and let us know how they how they work out all yeah right. You, all right <laughs> <laughs> matt you, you're actually you, you hinted on something my, that i wanted to bring up too as far as like gifting goes it's really difficult to be gifted you know, products from fishing products from folks, like you said, Anthony as well, it's very mm -hmm. niche, right? So, you know, usually when people are like, oh, what do you want for Christmas? I, you know, I don't know. I, I try to be very like specific if I can, if I expect to get anything, I don't want to give them yeah. anything that's, you know, uber expensive. So, you know, I got tip it for Christmas. You know, it's something that's super easy. Yeah, you know, just sent a link to my mom on Amazon, get me some five X <laughs> and six X tip it. And, you know, that's what she got me. Um, and then I also, Matt, you'll probably either appreciate this or not appreciate this. And I'll try to describe it for people who aren't going to be watching on YouTube. Um, Matt and Rob Worthing and a bunch of the guys that go fishing, they get they wear these tactical chest packs um, from Hill People Gear. And they're not inexpensive, but they're really, really like cool pieces of kit. And they've actually multiplied amongst our, you know, friends of fishing or fishing friends. I think five or six guys wear them now. You can actually see one if you go to the one Tenkara Angler video where Rob's doing kind of an on-stream demonstration at Tenkara Camp. He's wearing one on his chest. 
Um, I got a knockoff version on Amazon for like 30 bucks just to give it like a test drive to see yeah. if I like to see if I like the the tactical chest thing before I make the dive into uh, into hill people gear. But, um, you know, I did ask for that. Too. It was relatively inexpensive. And I figure if it doesn't work out for fishing, I'm sure I can use it for, you know, multiple other things, whether just to throw first aid stuff in there um, Absolutely. or, or what, whatever it might be. It's a good good kind of bag to kind of have and have and travel with so um that was kind of what i got i also got i also got like a, a kind of like a funny fish t-shirt from my mother-in-law um i'm not wearing it right now but um <laughs> she'll probably hit me hit me up for not doing that but um I, you know it's one of those things that like i said you know people know you fish they don't know what to get you so they get you kind of all this, mm -hmm. this goofy stuff and that's what i ended up with for christmas um you know on, on my fishing list i did cool. i did forget my, my daughter got me some stickers i'll have to um I have to take a a picture one, and you maybe you can like, uh, you know, put it up on the screen. Yeah, it's, sure. Um, this, this woman, I think she got them on Etsy, but she does like uh, trout and coffee and stuff. So there's like, a, she got me a print. So it's like a a coffee, like a pour over coffee maker with a with a trout, like a trout in, you know, in it, and then some stickers. There's one. It's Dolly Parton riding on a on a trout. <laughs> So, cool. but but they're pretty cool i think it's called steel bison i'll i'll take a snapshot and you can put it up there and if people are interested in checking them out but i forgot about those until yeah those are kind of good gift ideas for the angler you know uh sort of peripheral things <laughs> yeah those quirky little things and obviously anybody who's listening if you want to you know put in the comment section you know if you've got anything special for christmas or if there's something that you didn't get that um you know maybe you got some gift cards for and you, you want to go out and get afterwards you know let us know in the comments we'd love to you know chat about that um a little bit more so um with that aside i'm going to kind of turn the subject a little bit and um you know we're kind of talking about all this gear and we'll kind of keep it a little bit on that note but doesn't necessarily have to be gear one of the things that Anthony was kind of talking about to Matt and I was, you know, the, the little things in fishing. Um, you know, we like to talk a lot about rods and lines and flies and all like kind of those things that everybody kind of likes to see, sink their teeth in. But there are a lot of little things out there um, that can make or break an outing that, you know, probably aren't discussed enough. Um, you know, I know we all live in different places. We all fish in different ways. We probably have different things. So, you know, Anthony, I know this was your original topic. Why don't you kick it off and kind of talk about some of the little things that you work in your, into your, you know, fishing, whether it be preparation or gear or whatnot, um, that, you know, might be interesting to some of our listeners. Yeah. So, so I, I kind of broke it down and we didn't, and as a forward, we didn't really discuss this very much amongst ourselves. So, um, we may all three take completely different different tax mm -hmm. on them, which would actually be kind of cool so um so our, so our I choice kinda... to not prepare is an artistic one <laughs> absolutely right, for the right. record. makes for better you know, conversation it's, it's a choice it's, it's not just a lack of preparation okay good 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 spin so 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 i kind of broke mine down into like um off-season uh items uh pre-trip ideas and then on the water ideas so um, i'm not going to go down everything i'm sure you guys will touch on some of it but um a few like off-season or pre-season things i was thinking about um and i did the video about uh cleaning your 10 car rod so i uh years ago i left uh, uh one of my first 10 car rods wet in the rod tube and opened it up in the spring and the finish had had bubbled up and um it never it was never the same after that it got kind of stinky so if you haven't watched that video and you're new to Tankara, maybe check that out. And it's important to, to dry, you know, take that rod apart at the end of the season, especially dry it out um, and do that. And that can really, you know, if you don't have a lot of rods, that could really ruin your season if you open it up and it's mildewed and moldy and yeah. um, and stinky. Or, you know, I've put some, some terrible scratches in rods that I didn't clean out when taking them up, you know. So, so that's the one thing. The other thing that that, and I don't know if this happens as much anymore with new new tippet. It doesn't really happen with fluorocarbon, but I've had a trip ruined by old nylon tippet. So, you know, at the at you know before you start your next season, you know, take a look at that, especially the smaller diameter stuff. Give it some, you know, pull it, tie some knots, and see if that's holding up. Because I've gone on the stream and had tippet that was like worthless. It's funny you say that, Anthony, because one of the things that I have like a habit of is not checking my tippet before I go out. So I'll have like the spools all linked together, you know, like this or whatever, yeah, yeah. not actually looking to see like how much I have on there. 
So that was yeah. actually one of the things that I had on my list, kind of like the yeah, check off <laughs> is check your tippet. Make sure you got more than a length or two um, on there because you just never know what you're gonna what you're gonna get hung up on potentially. Yeah, yeah. no, so that that's why you know I I, I ascribe to the philosophy uh, for critical uh, gear that two is one is and one is none. Yeah. Uh, which is why, like, you know, if something critical like like 5X Tippet or, uh, you know, like I'm ne- I, I'm ideally never going to step out, you know, onto the water with only one of those. Right. Uh, just because I'm, I'm probably going to drop one that day anyway, uh, you know, whether or not it's a good Tippet or not. Uh, but, yeah, like it's just it's uh, it, redundancy. And that's, you know, that's yeah. part of my preparations is. Uh, is is making sure i have some redundancy i'm not saying you gotta you know carry a spare for everything you have but you know what's important and you know what's gonna Mm -hmm. like uh like i can't go out without some sort of uh you know uh i uh, reading glasses uh you know or some sort of like cheater capability in my fishing glasses anymore uh that's that's a level of preparation uh i've got to take you know uh yeah, yeah, absolutely. With the redundancy, Matt, that's, that's, yeah. I mean, that was some of the next things on my list. We're talking about that same thing, you know, cause um, I, I don't know who else has done it and maybe it's just me, but like, I've like lost lines when fishing, like the knot somehow gets loose. And if you're, if you've hiked back on the stream and that was the only line you had, <laughs> like that could really ruin your trip. So yeah, Matt kind of summed it up there, but with all that kind of stuff with uh, yeah, have an extra line. And especially as I'm fishing some lighter and lighter lines, um, with the thicker fluorocarbon lines, you usually don't have to worry about losing that in the trees. You, that'll usually bring a, you know, a smaller right. brick. But with the lighter stuff, I've broken the line. So wow, is that right? Huh? Yeah, yeah. So make sure you know that. So that's the other thing. You now is I always try to have an extra line and an extra tippet because so yeah, absolutely, redundancy. That's a good way to kind of sum that up, Matt. Thanks for that. Um, so that's some kind of preseason or or postseason, off season stuff. Um, the big thing. Like, um, and I guess, you know, it sounds like Mike will tackle some of the, like with the traveling angler angle, but the one thing I always do now for, um, for trips is I pack an extra set of clothes because I've fallen in the water and, you know, numerous times now, and it can be, even if it's a, on the way out, that could be a miserable car ride home if you're, sure. you're soaked to the, <laughs> so, so I always like make sure to throw in an extra set of clothes when I'm fishing, um, before my trip, because, um, yeah, that's no fun at all being totally soaked and if you want to if it happens early in the day you know that can really ruin your trip so i try to have that for sure the extra clothes um and then i said the one other thing for pre-season especially for new anglers um is if you're just getting into into tankara and and maybe a lot of folks will be with you know they got a rod for christmas um and you practice practice your knots you know because bad knots you know are going to be no fun on the water and it's not the time to be learning you know learn to tie those knots till you till you don't have to think about them because it's hard to remember if you've been fishing for a while how like that's tough when you start you know you're like you think you know it now you're on the water all of a sudden you're like how do you tie that orvis knot again so um you know a little bit of practice at home would could help you have some save some misery on the water especially when you're in the winter your hands get cold you know if you don't have that muscle memory it gets really tough so um so that's kind of my pre-season stuff um and I'll just touch a little bit on um, on the water, some of the sort of intangibles, and they kind of all go together. With um, you're you're on the water, you're fishing somewhere. Conditions are great. You think you should be catching fish, and you're not catching fish. Um, right. Rather than you know, so so the the thing that that I've learned with my myself is I think I get lazy, and I I get sloppy, and I'm spooking everything. So stealth. If I if I'm not catching fish, mm-hmm. like I. The one thing I can do that requires no no change in gear, fly, line, rod, or anything is I just start thinking about stealth. And I look at how I'm waiting, where I'm casting my shadows, and that kind of thing. And I think that that, I mean, it gets touched on, but but as one thing, and you guys could probably attest to that, like um, one thing that you can do to, to improve your game is to be a little more stealthy. <laughs> what do you think about that? I totally agree. I mean, I, I'm notorious for clumping around um, in, in the stream and all that stuff, you know, especially when you're when you're waiting one that's got, you know, uneven terrain and rocks and stuff like that. Just the 
the idea of going from you know different levels or hopping down off a rock or whatever like i shouldn't be doing that and i do it all the time i know i do and I, i'm scaring fish in the process yeah. it, it still says a a, a tour competency of tinkara yeah. fishing in in my book uh you've really got to kind of pay, pay attention to lines of sight and uh work the terrain and cooperate with it and uh yeah absolutely uh you know i think anthony what you're kind of touching on is that soft skill sets are you know just as critical you know, being able to review uh and take a look at our soft skill sets and see how they're fitting into our experience uh it's just as important as taking a look at whatever physical gear uh we're using <laughs> at, on the water yeah absolutely that's that's a great way to put it and and it's the kind of thing that you know that it doesn't cost anything you know to, to improve you know and it will mm -hmm. it'll improve your game a lot i mean i and not that it's important to catch every fish out there but i'm 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 still the kind of person that if i'm going out like i'm usually going out to catch fish you know i'm not going out to hike with the fishing rod you know that's mm -hmm. just the way everyone's different you know but but i get frustrated if i'm not catching fish <laughs> i'll admit it um so i kind of the last the last thing i wanted to talk about really was um casting accuracy i think a lot of people um you know don't think enough about like how inches can matter like i think a lot of times you know sometimes it doesn't matter sometimes the fish are moving and you know you're but i've fished uh off because i use i don't like to yard cast so i use my fishing trips as casting practice so i make right. a cast if it doesn't go exactly where i want i cast and cast again and and by doing that i've seen you know that first cast no fish no fish no, now i've gotten two inches closer to that rock and now i got a fish so i've seen that inches can really matter um and uh so casting accuracy i think i don't think it's talked about uh, enough you know um and uh not that you have to be perfectly accurate but that you need to think about where the flies go and not just not just think if you send it down the middle of that run the fish are going to come out and grab it because sometimes they will but a lot of times they won't Sure. Um, so, and like I said, I'm not a, I'm not going to yard cast, so I'm never going to do that. Like I'll do it to test a rod, but I just, uh, I don't find it enjoyable. Is there anything else I'd rather do, but I do it on the wall. So yeah, so think about that casting accuracy. And even if you're swinging flies, like, you know, you may think like if you're swinging flies, it doesn't matter that much because it's sweep, but it kind of does matter where you started, you know, the, the, the swing and everything. So anyway, I that's agree. Kinda... Actually, I, I think, you know, casting placement and having your, your kind of drift in mind before you even begin that process is, is a big deal. Uh, yeah. Cause you, you really want to be paying attention to like micro terrain when you're, when you're putting that, that fly through. So yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So those are kind of the, the, those three things are like when I'm on the water and I'm not catching fish, that's my checklist stealth casting, you know, uh, and casting accuracy. Those two things kind of um, are my, that's what I look at, you know, before I think about other things, you know, um, unless like if, if it's tough conditions, you know, you're going to, you know, you're out in the middle of the winter or whatever, it's high water. I'm not going to sweat it too much, you know, but I, mm -hmm. anyway, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I got guys. Whoever wants to take the next, the next segment. Cool. You got anything on that that you wanted to hit on? Uh, sure. You, you know, like uh, I think you, you, we'll, we'll hear some similar themes here to some stuff that Anthony was saying. Uh, this time of year for me is is kind of about uh, checking my equipment, going through and inspecting all of it and seeing uh, what condition it's in. Does it need to be repaired? Does it need to be replaced? Uh, the answer on my waiting boots and my waders right now is absolutely. <laughs> uh, my, both my waders are taken on water. The last time I went, I went out like two or three weeks ago, uh, hit Iowa and uh, had a great day out. Uh, but the whole time, you know, both my feet were wet and, mm. you know, I'm just, you know, 35 degrees and wet feet is just no fun. Yeah. I, I'm just past the point in my life where I need to be, uh, absorbing any more misery than I absolutely have to be. Right. Uh, so yeah, I'm in the same kind of question mode Anthony's talking about. I'm thinking about going back into a pair of those Choda hippies. Cause I really liked those, uh, when I had them before, uh, but that's that's something I gotta uh, be putting some attention into in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but then the other thing I'm thinking about this time of year is like, what did I do last year, and how well did it work? 
uh, you know, like on what waters did I use what tactics and flies and stuff. And, you know, basically I, uh, in, in my professional uh, life, long before I uh, met Tinkara, I did a lot of uh, after action reviews and analysis of things. And so I always like to do that with myself. So, you know, I'm asking myself for the season, what are three things that I want to keep? things that I want to sustain doing and what are three things that I want to improve, uh, <laughs> not necessarily stop doing, but things that I can do better. Sure. Uh, and I find that's a really good review process. I honestly tend to do that with most of my days of fishing, even, you know, on the drive home, I'm asking myself some questions about how did I do things today and was it effective and what can I change? Uh, and of course I make those adaptions on the water too, but there's a, uh, I want to say a broader strategy for the year or like, uh, you know, that uh, that I'm trying to uh, address. Uh, and then uh, things as far as gear goes, like uh, I think it's important to know yourself and what you need on the water. Like mm -hmm. I carry a handkerchief a lot because like being out and active, I get like I get mucusy. I don't want to be, you know, gross or anything, but like. You know, there are little things that you like, you know, about your own personal comfort that I think are important right. to, to to have along with you. Uh, and, and then you've got, you know, some things are safety related. Like I always make sure, I, you know, I myself have to take uh, some medications. You know, I don't go out for a day sure. of fishing without making sure I've got some extras with me on my body just in case I'm not able to get back to the car or anything like that in time to do it. Yep. Uh, on a more fishing related stuff, you know, I like to look at the terrain I'm going to be fishing and uh, basically plan my exit. Uh, like, I, I don't like to fish into some place and then be stuck there. That's really uh, smart. But yeah, I, I don't like, uh, and, and this is completely like my own OCD, but I don't like to backtrack either uh, on a route. So if I can, I'm going to make a circle, not only a circle, but it's going to be clockwise. Oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm that kind of OCD. But, uh, if you're fishing in the, in the southern hemisphere, would you would it still oh, be man. clockwise or would you go the other way? Uh, I was I would go the same way, but I would stand backwards. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. I uh I, I'll have to put some thought into that one for you. <laughs> yeah, so like I, I like to have a good idea of the terrain and I like to yeah. have a good idea of uh and 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 because uh, you know, I'm a different type of traveling angler than Mike. Mike makes very targeted trips, and I'm typically just kind of off, you know, doing my thing. Like, I need to have some sort of safety plan in mind a lot of times before I head off where people don't really know where I am in the middle 100%. of a national forest, uh, you, you know. And so, like, I, I put some time, you know, uh, putting my putting my face on the map and really taking a look at things and make sure I understand the terrain that I'm on. Now, you know, in the drift list, that's really easy, you know, because you can park at this bridge and walk to the next one. Uh, but it's a different story elsewhere. So those are some of the little things. Cool. Well, you both have mentioned, you know, I guess alluding to, to my traveling and that's kind of where, where I'm going to jump in on the little things. Um, a lot of the things that I do to make sure that I'm ready to have a, um, you know, a productive <laughs> outing, um, comes down to pre-planning. Um, I, as you mentioned, I do travel a lot to go fishing. I live in Florida. So if I want to fish Tenkara waters, it's usually a six hour drive or a flight or something like that. And, you know, just having that bag in the back of your car to just kind of go grab, you know, it isn't, isn't a reality, right? I need to make sure that I have what I need. So, you know, kind of what you were talking about, Matt, with your end of season preparation, making sure all your gears in check, you know, I make sure I do that, you know, the beginning of every trip um, before I leave, just to make sure that when I grab my bag or pack or whatever I'm going to use on the water that day, it's fully stocked and ready to go. Like I said, that the tippet spools are full. Like I might have tippet spools, but check, do I have a day's worth or do I have a week's worth on, on, the, on that tippet spool? You know, mm -hmm. obviously flies, you know, do I have enough flies? First aid kit. Um, most people probably don't know I'm on blood thinners, right? Just on a, on a daily thing. So I need to make sure that I have band-aids and things like that in my kit, you know? So if I do, you know, cut myself on a hook or, you know, whatever, you know, fall down on a rock, like I'm able to, you know, mend myself on the stream. And I've used that more times than I've actually cared to. But if it's something that I didn't have, that would be a, you know, kind of a messy situation on the stream. Basically, I want to get my gear in a place that I can just grab it that day 
and really only have to worry about putting on waders and boots and, you know, kind of going out. That way I maximize my time on the water. And speaking of maximizing my time on the water, I also try to check my, to figure out what my day's agenda is going to be ahead of time. When I fish with you guys, I'm very laissez-faire. Like I just, oh, whatever you guys want to do, we'll, we'll go out at 1030 in the morning. When I'm going by myself, um, you know, I want to make the most of that opportunity and not spend mm -hmm. half the day driving around trying to find a stream or, you know, whatever it might be. You know, I've usually got a long weekend or a day or two that I'm going to be able to fish and I want to take the most advantage of it. So, you know, those are two of the things that I do and I make sure that are in check to make sure that I don't have a, you know, an outing that comes up, uh, comes up zeros. Um, the other thing you're kind of talking about soft skills too. And this is something that I always try to improve upon, but especially for new fly fishers, tankara anglers, whatever they might be. Um, one of the best things that you can do is either, you know, search on YouTube or buy a book about reading water. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you, you can cast accurately, but if you don't know where you're casting towards, um, you know, you're just not going to find the fish because you're not going to be casting towards the fish. Um, and it's one of the things that I spent a lot of time, you know, kind of reading books on, like I said, watching YouTube videos, um, you know, there's a lot of sayings out there, you know, cast around rocks, foam is home, you know, all that sort of thing. Um, but you should really do yourself the favor of, you know, building up that skill set of being able to read water because you'll find at the end of the day um, that you'll be you'll be more productive when you do go out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I find that I still I still struggle with that. I've, I think we meant I might have mentioned it a little in the last podcast. Like I've I feel like I've become so focused on small to medium sized limestone streams that when sure. I get out of that comfort zone i'm a little bit you know something bigger or even get on the mountain streams i've just mm -hmm. become so owned in and um yeah like reading the water i feel like that's why i like good old-fashioned books because you can pick it up and go through it again you know as opposed to the internet where you gotta like search for stuff you know so what's that i, I don't know what you've looked at mike but i have the it's the tom rosenbauer i, I think uh orvis Got it. Uh, I, I don't have I don't have his book. There's another book that I have. It's just called Reading Water or something like that. I forget. Reading Trout Water. Water. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Matt. Yeah, yeah, and that 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 was one of the the best things I did for my angling was read that early in my career. So I agree with you on that. It's a it's a great book. All the diagrams in it and everything. Right. You know, honestly, without it, I probably would have just been flailing at every single piece of water on the creek. You know. Right, right. Because, you know, sometimes you look at, I know, Anthony, we've had a lot of great success up in the drift lift fishing those kind of riffly waters um, where they don't look like they would hold fish. But, you know, when you realize that, you know, a lot of times that's where the, wa the water gets the, the oxygen introduced to it. And that's where, you know, a lot of times fish like to hang out, especially when it's really hot. Um, you know, it can it can make what could be a tough day of fishing into a really, really good one. Looks like you grabbed the book or two, Anthony. What, what do you what do you got there? So this is the Tom Rosenbauer book on reading trout streams. So there's one that I have. I I, I haven't looked um, recently to see if it's in print, but I'm sure you can find copies of it if people are interested. Um, and the other one, and this might be the one you guys are talking about, the Dave Hughes book, Reading the Water. Yeah, yeah. That is it. Yep. Yeah. So that's another good one. So those are two good resources. And it kind of um, – it brings up another point then um sort of tangential but uh, i think tankara anglers or new tankara anglers might get caught up in you know um thinking about tankara so much and they don't look to the the resources that are available in the fly fishing world there's so much literature and even if it's not tankara specific um you can learn a lot from a lot of those other fly fishing books you know so if you're getting into tankara don't be afraid to like crack open those those fly fishing books too because there's just a most most of them are going to have sections on reading streams and you know things like that too so go ahead matt <laughs> you have a question on that note uh <laughs> next next podcast we're going to do a segment uh where we're each gonna talk about some uh at least one book that is a non-tinkara book that had an influence on our tinkara fishing this is something i wanted to do like a post or something about for a while it's been kind of kicking around in my head but i think that's a great topic uh anthony and i i'm i think that's that's awesome you brought it up so as uh the guy who's on the hook to quote unquote host the next one uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you we're gonna be doing that yeah that's a great idea good good so i think we just went over a whole bunch of little things and speaking of little things i'm gonna segue into flies right now so we're headed into we're in the winter we're in the middle of the winter right now it's end of december as we're as we're recording this right um 
Yeah. And um, <laughs> I, I'm just curious, are there specific patterns that you guys either tie or buy, you know, over the winter to, you know, fish in the colder uh, weather? Uh, I know the conventional wisdom is smaller patterns in the winter, but I really have found great success with fishing like size eight, size 10 uh, nymphs, uh, some with like good size tails on them, you know, like almost micro streamers. Oh. Uh, and, and actually giving the fish something to move for. Uh, I, you know, I, I just, you know, it's anecdotal. There's no science behind it. But personally, I've moved more bigger fish in, in winter with these larger flies uh, being fished low and slow or dynamically uh, than, I, than I ever have with like little mid-sized flies. Now, I'm not on like a tailwater or any sort of like delicate you know picky fishery most of the time but uh yeah so I, I tend to go for something uh kind of bigger and that's that's where i go what about you anthony um yeah so I, i'm lately i've just been fishing limestone streams a lot and i use pretty much like a beadhead muskrat nymph all the time for everything so um yeah i don't I mean, unless there's a hatch going on that's like i have a, a little beadhead pheasant tail or that muskrat nymph on um, well, that's like a waltz worm if you're familiar, you know, it's just a mus made with muskrat instead of hairs here. But, um, so I don't really change up that. Um, so I found like, um, I, through the, through the year I got, would get smaller and smaller. It seemed like I had to get smaller and smaller. And I don't know if that's just because of fishing pressure and then the fish are just, you know, being pounded with things. And it seemed like, or maybe I'm just getting a better drift in the slower, lower water with smaller flies. I'm not going to you know but it seemed like so i would say i was using four 14s things like that and then at the end of the year yeah, these are more like 18s um okay so um but uh but again i'm fishing a small limestone stream it doesn't really have the section i fish mostly doesn't really have a lot of big fish so i'm not putting on big stuff because they're mostly small fish so that's interesting that you say that because you do hear low and slow and tiny stuff but yeah, you know, yeah so maybe i'll put on some bigger bigger stuff like you say matt and give that a shot on some of the lower reaches and i mean they, they, these streams don't get super cold you know unless until the winter gets really cold they maintain like the driftless streams they maintain mm -hmm. a you know higher temperature so the fish never get totally you know lethargic like they might do in some of those mountain streams but yeah yeah and that's what i encounter i go up to the mountains usually at the end of january or early february is the first time that i go out post holidays and um, i fish two kinds of flies um i'll fish one actually one is a little bit larger it's not quite what you're throwing matt but it's a um it's actually the the hanryu kabari that the tenkara uh, discover tenkara guys yeah. I guess, kind of made popular um, it's basically a bead head with a peacock curl body and you know just a a wrap of of hackle on it um, but I do it in a size 10, um, which is, you know, a little bit bigger than what you might think. Um, and I usually kind of drag bottom with that first. I get, you usually get a little bit of luck. And then if that doesn't work, I'll go to smaller, just kind of standard nymphs. I won't mess around with like Kabari style nymphs or anything like that. At that point, I'll go to like a, a Pertagon or, you know, something like that. That's, um, you know, size 16 or 18 and, and see, see what I'm able to bring up. But I don't fish Kabari typically, you know, unweighted Kabari during the winter. I just don't find that the fish are. Mm -hmm you know, particularly active and coming up towards the, towards the surface that often. So, you know, I am, I'm, I'm a dirty nympher, if you want to call it that, um, you know, during, during the winter months for, for better or for worse. It's just a part of, part of my arsenal. And then I wait till, you know, spring to, to break out the unweighted stuff. I think you pretty much have to, I mean, you could, you could absolutely commit to like, I'm going to wet fly it and like, okay, maybe you'll catch a fish or two this winter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and if that's your, the experience you're looking for, more power to you, I suppose. But if I'm going to bother to go out when it's cold, I want some fish in the net. 100%. Especially <laughs> if you're going out in the, with bitter cold in the snow, whatever. Like, you don't want that mm -hmm. to be in vain, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. This is kind of uh, unrelated to Tenkara, but I listened to that Trout Bitten podcast, you know, quite a bit. And they there was one a uh, couple in a row they did about winter fishing. And okay. all the guys on that, you know, and their central PA, I think, is where most of them are, you know, that area. And they um, they say they have their best fishing in the winter, you know. And right. I don't know if it's because of less crowds, but they, they, they say they catch nice, like, big fish, more consistent days, 
Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I don't do it enough to really yet to, you know, draw those conclusions, you know, yeah. when I, when I was doing winter trips before, you know, I'm driving three hours to get out there and you've got a short day. Mm -hmm. so. But, um, but I'm going to try to do it this winter, get out and see, you know, what kind of, I've never had like great, you know, unless it's like, like, I mean, it's hard to call this winter. I mean, I think I'd be doing pretty well out there in the six, you know, if it's 60. <laughs> right. Right. I've never yeah. been great in the bitter weather, but they, they maintain that they've had some really nice days. So I don't know. It's kind of curious. I've had some good days with conditions in the 30 to honestly, even like a little bit, you know, like in the 25 to 32 range, I've had some good days on Iowa streams that are mostly stockers. Uh, but I've, you know, stellar days in winter are few and far between. And, you know, even, yeah, like a half dozen on a winter day in the driftless, I feel like it's really good. And they're usually going to make you work for it. Mm hmm. I take yeah. that in a second. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just to, because I don't think I prefaced my earlier comment to your original question, Mike, like I'm not, um, I'm no expert in the winter fly selection. So, so I'm not saying everyone go out and fish. It's just what I fish. And, um, you know, I, I would be, and now this is another thing I'd love to hear what, this is a great time for people to comment because um, uh, if you do get out, out a lot in the winter, either on the limestone streams and tailwaters or the mountain streams, like what, what do you find? Like, let us know, um, let, you know, share that with other people because um, I certainly am not put myself as out as an expert on that. Yeah. And I wouldn't either. I mean, I'm going to go out and try to catch a fish on new year's, but that's going to be in Florida in a retention pond. And I know what I'm going to use <laughs> <laughs> and it's not going to look anything like a Kabari, you know, it's going to be for a bass or a bluegill or something like that, just to get, get that skunk, that new year skunk, um, you know, off early. So we'll get, we'll try to give that a go. Um, yeah. I'll try to do it every year, you know, when I can, um, we'll see, hopefully it, it goes well this year too. Um, Anthony, you mentioned, um, you know, another podcast, um, but we had, uh, one of Tankara anglers own on a, on a different podcast as well. Tom Davis was on, uh, the Tankara talk podcast with Jason class about a week or two ago. And they had a kind of an interesting topic. It was what would be on your fantasy gear wish list. And, and their conversation a little bit meandered outside of fantasy gear, you know, to like, what would they like to see more of, or what would they like to see less of, um, in the tank car industry. But I'm curious what you guys thoughts on, on that are, um, Anthony, maybe I'll start with you. Is there any sort of fantasy gear that's yet to be invented or things you'd like to see more of or less of from the tank car industry? I, I would love to see an inner line tank car rod that was that fished like a great tank car rod you know and i know people have made them themselves but a commercially available rod that i could change the line length on um and not not to change the line length on necessarily to change casting distance mm -hmm. but just for the conditions that i fish and i'd love to be able to like strip some line in instead of always raising the rod to tip up you know now i don't know if that's ever going to be possible because you're always looking at a thicker rod tip right you know right but mm -hmm. um but if we're talking fantasy, I'd love to have a rod that I could like a ten car rod that I could strip line in. I think that'd be awesome. So hey, if there's anyone out there, you know, listening, Luong, maybe Luong can take care of it. <laughs> I'm sure he could if you gave him a hard enough nudge. What about you, Matt? I've been wondering if like thermal goggles or scopes would work through water. Like, I mean, because you can see animals, you know, heat differentiation, you know, with, with commercial thermal models a couple hundred yards away. Like, I only want to see 10 yards, you know, like down into the, the pool and everything. And I wonder if you might be able to, like, you know, get a, like a thermal look at, at where the fish are versus like a radar look. It wouldn't work well, uh, you know, in a lake or anything like that, but like, you know, driftless style streams or something like that. That would Might be work very well. Yeah, if I was gonna, you know, invent some sort of fantasy uh, fishing gear, it would be uh, it would be like thermal goggles, so I could see the fish. I like it. It it takes polarized lenses to a whole new level, right? I mean, yeah. that just, just to the nth degree, you become you put yourself in like predator mode, like from from the movie, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, honestly, you might be able to see some other really cool things. Like, I wonder if you've got you know like temperature different differentiations in the currents. Like how oh, that sure, would yeah, right. Thermals. That is true. I didn't even think about that. That would be pretty cool if it, if it worked like that. I don't know. Well, somebody will invent it. Maybe we want to invent that too. I honestly just thought of it while we were talking. 
Uh, so like I'm gonna kind of look at I'm gonna doodle some like do thermal work looking into water here when we get off the the show here. Interesting. I like it. Um, yeah, I, I gave this question a little bit of thought too because I listened to the podcast and I thought they all had uh, they both had a lot of interesting things to say. I think the one thing that I would like I think I would like to see, and this is. I think this could happen. It's just going to take time and it's going to take some resources for it, for it to happen. And, and maybe one of the companies is getting very close from what I hear um, is I'm a big fan of single length rods, um, you know, not zoom rods necessarily. I know Anthony, you're a big fan of zoom rods, so we won't, we won't necessarily go there. Um, but I would love to see an American company um, come out with a line of high end single length rods. Um, in terms of performance, fit, finish, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, some would say that Tanuki's rods are, you know, v pretty close. Um, but I, I would love to see one that is available from a mainstream standpoint where you could get replacement parts and not have to worry about, you know, sourcing those from overseas or whatnot. Um, I think that that's, I think that's the next step, the next evolution. I'd love to see a reinvestment, I guess, in what I'm saying in single length rods to see people just have to see brands have a, whatever it is, an 11, a 12, and a 13 that are as good as any rod out there. That's what I'm kind of looking forward to, I think, in the future. And I think everything right is, the, the pendulum is swung so much towards Zoom. I'd love to see it kind of start to swing back. That's my, those are my thoughts. Well, on that note, I haven't spent as much time as it with it as I would like, but I think the Dragon Tail Ragnar Arc is a pretty solid candidate uh, for kind of elite performance uh, in, in a single leg length rod, uh, you know, out of an American company. Uh, I'd say arguably we've probably reached that point with at least one rod. And as you mentioned, a lot of people consider Tanuki to be pretty close to that as well. Uh, you know, like in the fixed line category, if we, if we broaden it a little bit outside of Tinkara, I'd say, you know, Riverworks is ZX4 oh, sure. uh, is an elite performing rod but it's a different flex you know it, it's it's uh it's its own thing uh but yeah i agree with you that we're like definitely on the cusp of that and i i, I hope we see more of it yeah yeah i'm just yeah. looking forward to see see the point in time where the weights get lower the flexes get more you know they're, they're able to do more of a full flex um and do it at, at a lower weight i mean that seems to be like the holy grail right now that um you know a lot of the the rod makers are are kind of missing at least at this point and i know like you mentioned matt with the ragnarok and dragon tail's got another you know kind of prototype rod that's coming out shortly um you know there's i think people are getting really really close to it yeah yeah I, I, that i i i mean i like zoom rods but but um yeah i i think like i'm not as i'm not a huge gearhead you know i'm not that's not my my focus at all but um uh i was when you were talking about it, i was trying to think of what what made like what would make tip it in the direction of a uh, japanese quality rod or whatever you mentioned the weight would be one thing i guess um um but um but for me like i kind of given up with japanese rods a while ago and and i'll and the main reason is like i want customer service i want to be able to get parts 100 easily and um and the Japanese, as far as I'm aware, like no Japanese company has, you know, wanted to, has entered our market in that way that, you know, that there's a U.S., you know, easy access to parts and things like that. So um, but but on the plus side, I think that I could fish the rest of my life with with many, many American rods and, you know, wow. not feel like, uh, you know, I'm at a disadvantage. You know, I'm not saying that, you know, that that they're all perfect or anything like that but um but i just want to just a shout out to the american vendors thank you for still doing it you know i used to do it and yeah. it's, it's a lot of work and um you know matt used to do it and yeah. um, um and you know i i know about you matt but you could catch some flack from time to time as you know an american comp you know someone from america trying to do it um but i i know my my the reason I got into it was just to provide that for people, a, a source of rods, you know, that they could get here and yeah. have customer service. Um, so, uh, yeah, just a shout out to those people doing that, you know, th thank you for that. So, you know, sure, they're doing it as a business, but it is, you know, it makes it a lot easier for us <laughs> that want to fish. So, 
Cool. Anyway, sorry right. to derail it a little bit. There. No, it's, it's it's fine. You're you're absolutely right. I mean, availability is a is a huge ability um, to have when you're when you're offering products and as a consumer too, right? It's one thing to buy a rod and be afraid to fish it because if you break it, you're never gonna <laughs> you're never you hear you see those comments all the time. Oh, I bought an Oni type run, but I don't I don't fish it because I'm afraid to break it or whatever, you know. And you don't really hear that in other places. So, all right, cool. Well, let's pivot. Um, Last podcast, we played for the first time, I guess, the overrated and underrated game. And Anthony asked Matt and myself a couple questions. Some were pretty straightforward. Some were a little controversial. So um, we're going to play it. We're going to play it this week um, with Anthony and Matt. And I'm going to refrain. I'm not going to give my answers necessarily. But I have three topics and then a bonus one um, if we have time. So I'm going to start it out. Uh, Matt, you can answer this first one. Um, and it, again, the answer is either overrated, underrated, or why. Um, the first one is Sakasa Kabari. Ooh, uh, <laughs> it, be, it, yeah, you know, this is difficult because rated appropriately isn't a, uh, isn't an option here. Uh, so I'm going to say underrated because honestly, like the, the whole idea of the, of the Sakasa, uh, hackle is to provide an extra layer of action to the fly right uh so i i'm surprised that that concept hasn't caught on with like american and european fly anglers uh and become become uh more integrated into the larger fly tying world uh you know because there's there's a whole body of knowledge about how to tie leeches to make them swimmy and, right. and all that stuff you know so like i i i think i'll say underrated uh just because i i i i'm surprised that uh that that kind of innovation or mechanic hasn't been picked up and integrated more broadly i like it i like it what about you anthony what are your thoughts overrated or underrated I, I, i'm gonna also say underrated and and part of that's just because um, I'm so tired about hearing that not all Tankara flies are Sakasa Kabari. You know, <laughs> you always get that comment when someone shows a picture yeah. of one. And and I think it's the it, for me. I uh, I think it's underrated and, and it, kind of for what Matt says because it's it's of the typical other flies of Futsu Kabari, say in June Kabari. Like I feel like those exist in my fly box before I knew about Tankara, like flies that were very similar and did the same thing. But the Sakasa Kabari was, there was nothing like that one, you know, so that is uh, totally different, you know, so for that reason, I think it is underrated uh, because it brings something like, as Matt alluded to, something different um, to the to the fly box. Cool. I like those answers. All right. Question two. I'll start with you, Anthony. I'll stick with you on this one. Overrated or underrated? The dead drift. Gosh, that's tricky. I mean, so... <laughs> Oh, yeah, he's bringing boy. the pain this week. Coming out swinging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's tough. I'm going to say, I mean, I guess it depends on your audience. So I'm going to, so I, I'm going to waffle a little bit, but I'm going to say underrated. And I'm going to say underrated because um, I think it's like, um, it's like being a great musician, right? You need to learn, you need to learn a lot before you can break the rules, right? Like if you just start breaking the rules, it's garbage, right? So I think like, it's a fundamental thing to learn. Um, and then you can learn when you don't need to do it, you know, you don't. So I'm going to say it's underrated because I think it's a, as Matt called something earlier, a core competency, not yeah. that you always have to dead drift, but anyway, that's my answer. And I'm sticking to it. Nice building block. I gotcha. <laughs> All right, Matt, what do you, what do you think? Overrated or underrated dead drift? Uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, for the sake of argument, go with, uh, with, uh overrated just because i want to make a few points but first i want to say that i agree with everything anthony said so this isn't like uh, a rebuke by any means i just want to take another angle and sure. say that uh like action on the fly is is underrated in general i see like a lot of people really stick to the dead drift and yes it catches fish and it is the core it is a core competency and you've got to know how to do it and understand why it works and all that but like that point where you break free and you understand when you can start moving the fly and how i think there's a there's a huge world of fly manipulation that a lot of people i don't know if they just aren't comfortable with it or don't know quite 
you know, how to approach it or whatever. Uh, but I, I, I don't think there's enough attention paid to dynamic fly movement. But but yeah, I, I this is not like, you know, like uh, something that I'm vehement to, uh, you know, feel <laughs> passionately about. I, I just think people uh, should free themselves up more from the dead drift. Now, I always, you know, my, my first flow through, uh, my, my first drift through an area is universally almost always a dead drift. Uh, the second one may have a few taps added to it, but it's, right. you know, like I start progressively adding ashing as I go, but I'm never going to stop dead drifting. So, like, I'm not suggesting people don't do it by any means, but but move that fly and, you know, work with it and see what it does in different uh, portions of the water column and different types of currents and different actions uh, with your hand. And, yeah, move your fly. Cool. cool. I like I like those answers. One of the reasons why I asked that is, you know, when you go back into the, you know, the a lot of the the opening discussions about Tenkara, I always focus on the drag free drift and you know stuff like mm -hmm. that is one of the main benefits or whatever. So I was just curious if you thought that that was, um, you know, something people should get hung up on um, or not. Could I could I add a little bit, a little bit? Knock yourself so, out. So the, the the thing I think that is interesting though with with Tenkara gear the and with with since I do a lot of Euro nymphing thing with Euro rods like the 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 progression to lighter and lighter lines and lighter and lighter flies makes the the dead drift itself an active drift and i think that's mm -hmm. so like they've, they've kind of merged like because you've gone to small you can cast such small flies and you have such low sag from your line when you're drifting a fly without adding action on purpose it's the the point is that it's moving a lot on its own now it's moving up and down it's not yeah, yeah. sure so, so nice. dead, dead drifts, yeah. So dead drifts have become an ideally, and I think that's what a lot of the Euro guys would tell you. That's what they're going for. They want, you know, their quote unquote dead drifts, but it, in the sense that the fly, you're trying to let the fly do what it would do, not normally just, do in the water. So yep. it's not free yeah. of all motion. It's free of all unnatural motion. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Okay, I could see that. Very cool. I like I like that differentiation. Um, third question, and I think, Matt, you answered last, so I'll start with you on this one. And this one could be controversial. We might get some some blowback uh -oh. on this one. Overrated <laughs> or underrated? Stocked fish. Underrated. <laughs> you know what? Like, okay, like, uh, people who fish with me know that, like, I'm, I'm, I'm about catching fish deliberately. And, like, I will complain about fish that I catch accidentally. Uh, like, you know, fish that are, you know, like when the, the flies just dangle in there or, or what have you. But like, ultimately, a fish, on, a fish on the hook is a fish on the hook. And, uh, you know, actually, I'm putting together a little video that I shot earlier this year, uh, back in November, uh, where I took advantage of a, of, of a pool of stockers for a couple of days. Uh, and the value there <laughs> is that you can you can practice. You can practice. Uh, it, it's it's almost as good, uh, you know, or a good pot of stockers is almost as good as a pond full of bluegill for being able to repeatedly work on the mechanics and, and, and kind of remove yourself from the anxiety of whether or not they're going to eat. And don't get me wrong, there's, you know, plenty of times when stockers don't eat. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I like them because it's... Uh, it, I don't know. Like, I, I don't want to say like it's it's like a mini putt experience versus golf. You know, like there's there, there's like sometimes I want the challenge of wild fish. Sometimes I just want to catch a ton of fish. You know, and stockers are good for that. And uh, my my after note to that is I think stockers are good because uh, they are the product of involved uh, community. It involves like trout management and watershed management. Sure. Uh, so, like you look at Iowa, which is uh, run almost entirely as a stocked fishery, as a put and take fishery. Uh, they they publish, you know, the the schedule for the dumping trucks on the uh, on the website, and people show up with buckets, you know, and uh, but that gets people involved, and people care about the watersheds. And, you know, they're willing to pay for their licenses and that goes to conservation work. Yeah, I mean, stockers have their place both as a sport fish and kind of within the larger ecosystem of our of our community, I think. So you say underrated. What about you? Yeah. Anthony? What do you say? 
Yeah, this is tricky. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack in that, you know? So mm -hmm. just like Matt did earlier, for the sake of argument, I'll say overrated. And, and I'm going to say that kind of with like someone who has an embarrassment of riches in wild fish, pretty easily accessible, <laughs> you know? Um, so I guess my, my thing is I, uh, I think that stocked fish get a lot of people into it. You don't may not have access. You can't, you know, your dad's going to take you out for the day and you're going to go to a stock stream because it's what you have access to. And that sure. is mm -hmm. great. Like so you get, you get anglers and, and everything. Um, you know, there's the whole other side is like stalking over wild fish, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. so, you know, that's, that's a real problem. So that's, that's where I kind of have a problem with the stocked fish is, is that, you know, I know some states and I think Maryland does this, like, I think it's Maryland. They won't stock if there's wild, they won't stock over wild fish. And I'm, there's probably some other states that are like that, which I think is, is good, you know, like leave the wild fish alone, you know, stock where you can. So I'm going to say overrated simply because of the environmental, you know, kind of impact. And um, for an example of where I think it is awesome is Missouri. I don't know if you've ever been to Missouri and fish trout parks. I think that's an awesome example. They've got these, these if you don't, if you're not familiar, there's four or five of them in Missouri. There are spring creeks. Um, as a traveling angler, they're great because you can go in and you don't have to even buy a state license. I don't think it's like a day pass that's fairly inexpensive. It, it, the price of it covers like three fish. So they stock three fish for every angler that buys a ticket that day. Um, there are sections of the streams. There's like a bait section and a fly fishing catch and release section. And I think if I'm if I'm correct, like the brown trout you have to release because they may be wild and the rainbows you, you can keep three of them okay. or whatever. Um, but you see you see all these families fishing, right? You got, um, I, you see the kids are fishing and the dads there and, and couples are fishing together. And it's just, you see a lot of people, it may not be everybody's thing, but to, to Matt's point, you get people that are out there, they're outside, they're not watching TV, you know, and, and it's, yeah. and, it's and it's constrained. And, and I like how the fish are raised there and they're stocked there. So you're not driving trucks of fish all over the state you know so like the impact the impact is less you know um so i, I think that's kind of cool and they had the foresight somewhere along the road i don't know the history of the parks to to make them parks you know so there's access that that otherwise might be private you know and and um so so i i think they kind of do it right you know so we got one overrated and one underrated got it yeah. Um, I got one more bonus question and I'll start with you, Anthony. Anthony, you've been talking a lot about, um, fishing footwear and stuff like that. So, um, I'm curious, overrated or underrated Crocs? <laughs> so, okay. So I famously, I, I used to tell my, my family, like, if you see me wearing Crocs, like rush me to the hospital. Cause there's something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Like something has gone wrong, but um, so this lat, you know, so so I'm gonna say underrated, it, which which surprised yes. even me, surprised even me because I'm a convert. You know, I used to poke fun at you for them, you know. But when I was fishing this year in in the driftless, I had leaky, slightly leaky waders, you know. So I'm taking my waders off, and my socks are wet. So now I got to either like take I got to take off my sock and I get wrinkly and put them back put my sockless feet back in my shoes you know or my wet socks in my shoes and so I went to Walmart I didn't actually buy Crocs but I bought whatever their cheap version is and sure. and and it was like a convert they're the perfect companion to my waders now you know I take off my waders put the Crocs on it's just it's beautiful so I would say they're underrated if you don't have them get them all right <laughs> Matt what are your thoughts on Crocs uh, I've never owned a pair. Uh, I've only seen people that. clomping around in them. Uh, but you know, as uh, as the concept of the ch the the, the slip-on comfy shoe goes, uh, I'll say underrated. You know, I'll I'll say they're great. I I, I like Anthony too. Like for footwear like that, uh, I I don't mind cheaping out. Like. Uh, so like I'm I'm big on like going to Walmart and spending 20, 30 bucks. In fact, I have my winter twenty dollar Walmart shoes. Solid. Oh are nice. They're like insulated and everything, mm -hmm. but they're like slip they're like winter slippers. You can go outside in them, they're awesome. Uh but then you know, conversely, I just bought a, a pair of like I've been wanting a good pair of boots for a while. 
Uh, and I, I just popped like, you know, 300 bucks on a pair of Red Wings because I want boots that are going to last, you know, as long as possible. Uh, but I'll burn through like these $20 cheap shoes, like your your uh, your Crocs. This is what I'm saying. Like, the, 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 I don't know if even, and how much Crocs actually cost, but the concept of the, the, the cheap sandal, uh, underrated for everybody. Like everyone should have a pair of like throwaway shoes. Nice, nice. Well, that went better than I thought it would. I, for those that don't know, I'm a, hu I'm a huge Crocs fan. Um, I don't wear them while waiting. It's actually that's one of the things that always pops up online. Where whenever you're in a whatever it is, a Facebook group or an Instagram chat, and people talk about you know waiting, wet waiting shoes, undoubtedly somebody throws Crocs into the mix, and that usually gets a lot of response, like oh you're going to break your neck, whatever. I don't use personally use them for waiting, but I know a lot of people do. I mean, if you watch the if anybody watches the Flicky Flies videos on on YouTube, um, Chris, who makes those videos, he pretty much wades in Crocs all the time. Um, so yeah, you know, I'm not advocating nor you know I guess dissuading you from using them as wading shoes. But I think to your point, both Anthony and Matt, as camp shoes, post fishing, yeah. you'll, find, you'll you'll find me in Crocs all the time. Um, you probably did when we were together, you know, a couple months ago. Um, you know, I, I I wear them all the time. I think they're great. They dry out quick. Um, in the winter, they'll keep your feet warm, um, even though they have holes in them. I think they're, I think they're a great camp shoe. Anyway, yeah. and I'll, I'll add another benefit of the crock. Um, we recently had a metal roof put on our our cottage, and um, walking around the the grounds in my crocs was a good way to find all the little tiny metal shavings that were laying around because they all started to through my my crocs. <laughs> well, it's better than finding them in the bottom of your feet. Agreed. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, so they're really they're they're really good at picking those up. Nice. I thought they you were gonna say they were providing insulation from electrocution or something like <laughs> that. Like you said. Metal roof. Uh, um, all right, cool. Well, we're almost done. One thing that I did want to bring up before we wrap this up is uh we announced um about a week or two ago that uh, Tenkara Angler, um, in conjunction with Tenkara Guides, specifically Rob Worthing, um, are going to hold a Oni school in the Appalachians for the first time. Matt yeah. is going to be one of the, the folks kind of on the ground running the event. So I'll kind of turn it over to you, Matt, to kind of give people an update on what it's all about and what they can expect should they you know, want to attend. Yeah, it's very cool. Uh, we're excited to be bringing this to the Appalachians for the first time because, uh, you know, the the only school with uh, Masami has been held uh, entirely out in Utah. Uh, and so people have to travel to that. And then we've done, uh, Rob and I have done only schools for a couple of years up in Wisconsin, uh, but we've never been able to bring it uh, fully out to the East Coast for a, uh, a full on experience. Uh, so what we've got going on is April 4th through 7th. Uh, at the Lake Logan Resort, uh, we've rented a cabin uh, in which uh, people who are coming to the school can stay. It's optional if they want. Uh, but we'll have, we have two eight-hour days of instruction during which you're going to learn a lot about casting. You're going to learn a lot about how you approach the water and how you play fish. And uh, you're definitely going to walk away having really upped your game in Tinkara. Uh, Rob and I uh, both, uh, in addition to our Tinkara experience, have extensive experience as, as instructors in our professional lives. Uh, so I think we've, we bring a pretty unique school to the table in that uh, we're one of the only places, uh, you know, and again, this is the asterisk because I know there's the only school with Masami himself, uh, but we're one of the only places you can go and get a, a, a full uh, kind of education uh, in the course of a couple of days and, and really walk away with uh, some advanced tools. And uh, the cool thing about this is we've done it several times with people who are just starting Tinkara. Like last year, we had someone who like, he, he just bought a rod, you know, he'd never fished with it once. And uh, he ended up being like kind of our, our, our absolute standout student as far as the way he went after things and, and uh, really, really developed his his casting skills over the course of two days uh so it's two days uh it's five hundred dollars for the two days of school if you do not stay with us at the cabin uh there's an additional ninety dollars worth of uh fees from the location itself 
Uh, but to me, that's 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 a pretty good price if you look at uh, what uh, a day's a, a day of guiding fishing costs. Uh, getting two days of of uh, instructed guided fishing for five hundred dollars is is definitely in line with if if not uh, a value uh, compared to with some of the other price points out there right now. Uh, but then, yeah, uh, if you want to pay an extra two hundred fifty dollars, you'll stay at the resort right there. Uh, it doesn't have uh, we're not feeding you, but it does have a full kitchen for you to be able to feed yourself. Uh, so it's going to be beautiful private water. It's going to be uh, an immersive instruction experience where you develop your own uh, personal style of fishing based on the principles uh, that Rob is going to focus on uh, that are found in Oni Tinkara. And uh, it's going to be a great time. Uh, we always have a lot of fun. So, so Matt, yeah. you said it was 500 for two days of instruction? Yes. And it's three say? nights of uh, lodging, essentially. You know, you can yeah. basically get there the night before and then we'll leave that Sunday. Yeah. Uh, so, so, yeah. So, to your point, are... that's, that's, that's a, an amazing bargain. I mean, I've been out with some, some guides, some high level guides and, for, I don't know how many hours you're talking about, but I've paid, you know, almost that much for half a day. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, 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 uh, I hope we'll see some new faces. You know, so far as far as people signed up, we do have mostly new faces, which, uh, which is exciting. You know, we want to be able to spread this out as, uh, as far as we can go. For anybody that's interested in that, um, it was what April four to seven. Do I have those dates right, Matt? Correct. And if you go to the Tinkar Angler website, uh, right now it's still uh, the, the post about the 2024 North Carolina Oni Tinkara Immersive is still on the front page. But you can just uh, search for Oni and it'll be the, well, you'll see it. <laughs> cool. So we'll, we'll also put a link, um, you know, in this, in the YouTube video description, um, you know, to, to get you to our events page um, relative or our schools page relatively quickly too. We'll put that in the, uh, in the description so you can find it. So um, I think that's pretty much it, guys. I don't know. Did you have anything else that you wanted to hit on real quick before we before the we end this podcast? I've got from when I was um, selling Tankara gear, I've got line spools, these foam line spools. I've got hundreds of these things still. Um, so I was thinking, um, I think this is like a hundred of them. So nice. <laughs> so I've got more of them. I got way more of them. So the one thing that I forgot to mention in my off season, the OCD thing I like to do is I take all the lines that I've put on spools. I go, I measure the length and I get my micrometer out and I measure the diameter and then I relabel them because they inevitably they get all switched around, you know? So I, I put the, I should have made these a different color. These are black, but anyway, so I was going to say for anyone who comments below that wants to win some, so I'm, I'm going to say, I don't want to send out a bunch of different ones. I'm going to send someone 50 of them and they can send Ooh. to their friends and family if they want. <laughs> but um, if, you, if you're interested, they're, they're great foam spools, you know, you, uh, for even if you're uh, doing your own and stuff as well, you know, put stuff on there. So anyway, if you want them, comment below um, at the time of this video. I'll let it, I'll let it go from when the video, say uh, a week from when the video is posted or whatever. Um, if you're listening on the podcast, go to the YouTube video and comment that you want the spools and I'll send them out to someone. That's very nice of you. So yeah, if you want some spools, make sure to comment in the in the, in the comments below on this video and um, looks like you'll get 50 of them to do with yeah. as you choose. That's right. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's about it, guys. I did want to thank you for hopping on the day after Christmas to uh, to record this. Um, obviously, for folks that um, you know are listening to this um, on whatever your streaming service of choice is, we'd love to start getting some reviews. I see, you know, Apple to give five star or whatever reviews. We'd love to get some of those. Um, and obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd appreciate it if you'd uh, you know like and subscribe to our channel. Um, with that, I'm going to kind of end the uh, the podcast now. Oh, one other thing I did want to mention, we will have a print magazine coming out shortly. Did want to sneak that in real quick. Um, probably more about that on the next podcast, um, but uh, did want to did want to mention that right now. We did get a lot of great submissions and, you know, that is coming out shortly. So um, with that, I guess I'll I'll end the podcast. Thanks, guys, for joining today. Good to hang out. Catch Thank you, you soon. Thanks, everybody, Enjoyed for listening. It. I'll talk to you soon.